I would like to kindly welcome you to an exciting seminar, It From Bit, or Is Universe a Digital Computer, which will be given by Professor Koltuksus. I'm sure you all know that this seminar series started in 2019 spring, while still we could have these meetings in vivo. On these seminars, we were fascinated by the idea the universe as a whole, governed by a physics engine, wherever we look from gigantic stars to subatomic particles. In this context, we have discussed time, mass, light, black holes, and many, many more. During this series, we understood that the universe has a modular design, just like it's a piece of software where the underlying code is independent of the scale and environment. Whilst uh, with the challenging times of uh, 2020, more and more, we want to believe that this is certainly a simulation and someone is just having fun out there watching. Mm -hmm. Today, Professor Koltuksus is going to take us into a journey in the depths of this giant simulation where he often described with the words, and I quote, <laughs> The universe is a simulation in a PhD study of a grad student, and unfortunately, it's not a good one. Without further ado, I would like to give a brief introduction to Professor Koltuksus. He earned his PhD from Computer Engineering Department of Egypt University with a dissertation thesis titled Cryptoanalytical Measures of Turkey Turkish for Symmetrical Crypto Systems in 1995. In his academic journey, he established and ran the Information System Strategy and Security Laboratory in ISTEC and Cybersecurity Research Laboratory in Yashar. He had graduated and mentored countless grad students, and I'm probably one of those, in Asian University, ISTEC and Yashar University. Prior to this series, he has organized a joint conference with Astrophysics Department of Asian University titled Black Holes, A New Perspective on Information and Storage. Later on, his studies on information theory and black holes are presented in Information Universe Conference at the University of Groningen, which is formed by an elite research society on information, including Nobel Prize winner and or extraordinary scientists. His research interests have been information theory, continuously differentiable structures, blank scale simulations, theory of computation, theory of numbers, and also you might know him from his works on cyberspace uh, defense and security. As I have personally witnessed in the last 11, 12 years, he has been conducting research on definitions of information in the fields of philosophy, computer science, cosmology, biology, and also statistical mechanics. And today we will enjoy a seminar built up over many years of experience. Uh, Professor Koltuksus, floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for this nice presentation. And um, let me... Uh, share the screen and so uh, okay hopefully uh you guys all been uh, able to see the uh, screen that's what i'm seeing at the moment and the title as you've uh, um, said Jot, I, it's the uh, it from bit that's the phrase which we'll be talking about or is universe a digital computer? So uh, we'll be talking Professor, about what kind of- Excuse me, yes. I, I think we cannot see your screen uh, for the moment. You don't see it? Okay, can, anyone, me... is, can anyone see the screen now or we, we just see you, which is- Okay, let me, all right, wait a second, share. Yeah, now it's coming. Better now? Yeah, is yeah, great, great. Okay. Sorry for the interrupt, please continue. Okay, now. so. Okay, so perhaps you're now guys uh, seeing it? All right. So let me uh, rephrase it. Uh, we'll be talking about if the universe is a digital computer or not. And probably by the end of the talk, we'll be talking or asking the questions whether that assumption is true or not. So here's the agenda. Uh, I'll start uh, with a definition and a very, very short history about the computation. And uh, we'll be talking about the computation as we know it today. So, and then we'll be talking about the limits of computation, which will actually take us to the uh, uh, deep questions that uh, will be asked. So, um, here's the uh, small definition and a very short history so that we'll be understanding uh, why we're uh, talking all about that. Okay, um, by the uh, Webster Dictionary, uh, Dictionary says computation is the act or action of computing calculation. And actually this uh, computing or having a computing machine is one of the biggest dreams of the mankind. And the uh, pioneers actually started the 17th and 18th centuries 
Pascal, Euler, and Gauss, and later on in the uh, 19th century, we have the Charles Babbage and his uh, quite famous difference engine, analytical engine, right? You're seeing here, uh, actually signed by him. But these guys are actually these scientists were the pioneers. And the uh, as for the father of the computing machinery, we have uh, two people here. One is Konrad Zuse, a German uh, person, actually. is um, very famous with this small book, Calculating Space, which can be downloaded through the uh, internet. And I very much urge you to download and read it because it's not just the, um, you know, gives us the basic idea about how a computer can be done. Also, uh, he gives us the basic ideas about what we're going to be uh, discussing today about whether the universe can be a computer or a giant cal calculating machine or something. So is the actually the, one of the founding powders. And also, of course, Alan Turing here uh, during the Second World War, uh, he was able to uh, build a machine to crack German codes, the Enigma codes. So today we have the, um, the, uh, uh, the Turing machines named after him. Okay, so let's talk about the computation as we know it today, okay? Uh, first of all, we have the universal Turing machine named after Alan Turing actually in 1935. Today, it's, it just gives us the basic found, uh, foundations of the uh, modern computers. And uh, actually, it's very um, uh, theoretical idea as to have a, one unlimited memory on a tape, okay, which is, uh, uh, which contains the cells This abstraction is what we are called the uh, modern computers uh, today. Here is one small picture. This is your endless tape here. As you can see, it's divided into the cells as it's something like this. And uh, moreover, this tape is unbounded by actually. And uh, this tape is divided into the cells, something like this. And each cell contains the uh, instructions uh, right here and your input probably is a data. And then by executing the, uh, the old instructions, you just get the output. So this is what the uh, Turing machine is all about. This is of course an abstraction, but this abstraction actually, when you combine it with the Silicon world today, gives you the uh, contemporary computer. So this is the whole idea behind the computation as we know it today in a mathematical terms as an abstraction. Um, this is a little bit uh, more uh, seen it. See, this is an endless tape goes all to the infinity and the cells and your instructions here. And uh, formally, you could represent it something like this. These are just the uh, formal abstractions of what we know as the computing today. And right here um, is a contemporary uh, view. So you have the input uh, devices like the keyboards, like the hard disks, okay? And those input devices actually are the means of getting your data into the system, okay? And as for the processing, we have the silicon-based uh, totally closed physical system called the microprocessor or processor or central processing unit CPU. And this is the guy who does the processing and the processing itself takes place within the memory right here. And this, this whole thing actually known as the computation here. It's a physical silicon-based totally closed system actually. And as for the output, you can get your results onto your screen or probably right through to uh, right directly to the hard disk or some other uh, mediums. So this is your input processing and output or better known as your data when you process it, when you compute it, you just get the information as a result. So this is one of the computational models, a Turing type computation model as you know it today. Um, but it's not the only one. We have the uh, cellular automata again invented by famous John uh, von Neumann. Um, this is a little bit different. Um, you just start out with the rule set right here, okay? Well, your, your, your rule set says, okay, if you have zero, 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 and that means zero, 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 one, that means what, something like that. You just define a rule set in a very easy way. And then this is your bit stream here. And for each bit stream, 
constitutes the first generation, for instance, in here. And by applying the rule set here, you just end up the second generation. So this is a working principle of the um, cellular automata. Actually, this is one dimensional uh, cellular automata. And if you uh, go a little bit uh, beyond that, you have the uh, checkerboard, something like here. And this is called the two dimensional cellular automata, actually. And the importance of this two dimensional cellular automata actually comes from the fact that uh, the game of life, uh, the famous mathematician John Conway, which uh, well, whom actually we lost him to the COVID a few months ago, uh, just about less, uh, less month, I believe. So he died of a COVID uh, epidemic, pandemic here, okay? And uh, he, he was very famous with this cellular automata game of life. Actually, this is not the, the, uh, a game, it's not a uh, computer game. Actually, it's a simulation of a real life. By applying a couple of simple rules, you could actually uh, simulate the, the, the whole life itself because of this simplicity and the gigantic results. This game of life of John Conway uh, has been a very, very uh, important and very famous one. Again, uh, there are many applications of it you can download. So if, if you haven't done so, again, I urge you to download this, uh, this game of life and simulate the life itself. And today, actually, we've seen lots of uh, simulations of this uh, corona uh, pandemic based on this, this kind of simple uh, rule sets to simulate the, uh, the, the, uh, the pandemic of virus, something like this. Okay, so this is the, one of the uh, computational models, the cellular automata quite different than the uh, Turing machine. However, uh, what is important here is the cellular automata, which is proven mathematically, has the equal power of computation with that of the Turing machine, actually. So these two models, I mean, the Turing machine, TMs, and the cellular automata are the best uh, computational models that we have uh, today. Uh, the another one, actually, that's an uh, alternative computational model, DNA uh, model. Uh, this Leonard uh, Adleman, he's one of the founding fathers of the RSA crypto system. He's the, actually the A of the RSA. He's been working on it. And the important point here is, here's another uh, publication here, um, just about um, seven years ago. Uh, some people were actually were able to put the, uh, the digital data into the uh, DNA and then they were able to uh, recover it back with the 100% accuracy. Now that means that it is now possible to use the DNA as the storage medium, not, the, not as a processing medium, not as a processor, but as a storage medium. Yes, we have the means of using the DNA probably very soon when we uh, just crack the code of the uh, molecular biology, we'll probably be able to simulate the uh, brains so that we, we will be able to uh, create the molecular computing that way. But we have a way to go for at least 100 years or so for this alternative uh, DNA computing. Here's another one, the quantum computers. That's another alternative we've been talking about very much. And we have the different qubits right here, quantum processors like the um, superconducting trapped ions, Rydberg atom, uh, atoms, and the silicon base. So the, the uh, quantum computers are just probably around the corner, but we still have some problems on them. We haven't yet invented the fully programmable uh, quantum computers, but we're working on it. So this is another alternative computational model as a computation. Right here, as you see, uh, okay, this is the IBM system 153 qubit here. And uh, this is a microelectronic here and the cooling uh, units here. So uh, if you examine this carefully, you probably uh, find out what the, uh, the quantum computers is all about at the moment. But again, this is still an alternative, a very powerful one at that. And we keep hoping that uh, we're gonna one day uh, have a multi-programmable or multi-functional quantum computers, but that day has not uh, come yet. Okay. Now, um, these are the uh, uh, computation as uh, you know today, but then again, uh, there are some limits to computation actually. So that, that means that you cannot have a computer which is able to compute everything and anything with the speed of the light or something. So uh, it's better for us if we know the limits of computation so that we'll just jump into the, 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 the big questions right after it. Okay. Um, but before jumping into that, let's uh, remember a little bit uh, constants and equations for which I'll be using it. So here's the Planck's constant. It's defined as the ratio of constant between the energy of the photon and the electromagnetic wave frequency of photon right here. So e, uh, that energy is equal to the Planck constant and the new day, that's the electromagnetic wave frequency. And that's the H actually, 6.62 uh, times uh, 
10 to the minus uh, 34 joules uh, second, actually. And Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty, that's also important, okay? That's the uh, position of the particle and that's the momentum. And these two values, when you uh, multiply them together, they cannot be smaller than the Drax constant here. And that's the Drax constant. Actually, it's known as the reduced uh, uh, Planck's constant, okay? Um, so these constants, which uh, I'll be using very frequently, so for that reason, I've just added this slide so that, you know, uh, anytime we uh, forget, we just come back to those slides, okay? And also Einstein's uh, energy and mass equivalence. Uh, what that means is, now let's start with this Lorentz factor here. That's the stretch factor. That's also known as a stretch factor. That's gamma here, one over uh, square root of one minus uh, V squared over C squared. Okay, that's known as the Lorentz factor here. And now look at here, we all know this, right? E equals MC squared. Actually this M here, the mass, not a typical mass that we know, but it's the relativistic mass. The relativistic mass means that you just multiply the mass with this stretch factor here to uh, recover the, to obtain the uh, relativistic mass. And actually this uh, mass here and the energy equivalence is no longer a famous uh, formula known as the e, e equals m squared, but this m again is a relativistic mass here. Okay, so that's uh, to remember it. Okay, now uh, let's talk about the uh, limits of the computation. So the, so the first limit uh, or the first factor uh, that stops us uh, is known as the bit rate or the processing speed. Now that means that can we have a computer which works with the speed of the light or probably faster than the speed of light? No, so there are some limits, okay, uh, in terms of the computation. The first one is the Bremerman's limit, okay? Um, it's the maximum processing speed actually defined by Bremerman, which can be achieved in a self-contained in the universe right here. So it's derived from the Einstein's mass energy equivalence and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And here's the Bremerman's limit, okay? And it's just about the uh, 10 to the um, 47 bits per second. So this, this limit defined by the Bremerman actually um, many years ago, but when he was defining it, so here is the M is the mass of a computer, that's the speed of light and that's the Planck constant here. And if you uh, apply this formula, you just end up with the 10 to the 47 bits per second. And here's an example, uh, the bit rate for a one kilogram laptop, which is practically your laptop see here by the Bremerman's limit uh, is able to perform 10 to the 50 uh, bits per second as a maximum speed. However, now this limit was later on corrected by the addings of the general relativity by Gennady Gorelick here. And now the corrected Bremerman's limit is known as uh, something to the uh, 10 to the 43 bits per second. Okay, so again, this is the gravitational constant, Planck constant, and this is the speed of light. So by the uh, relativity, so we have the, the, this one as the bit rate. So that means that you cannot have the silicon based computer which is uh, able to perform or calculate many, many uh, bits per second, uh, something, something uh, much more than uh, speed than that. So this is one of the limits. Okay, let's, um, let me go back one more, previous here. Um, here again, this uh, Bremerman suggested that the maximum bit rate of a computer with mass with a mass equal to the mass of the Earth is 10 to the 75 bits per second, okay? And if you wonder what is the mass, the current uh, of the Earth, that's what it is. That's the current estimated mass of an Earth right here, okay? Uh, this is the best at the, uh, at, at the time, uh, at the moment. Um, every year we, we're just getting a more clear, more uh, accurate uh, values for this, but at the moment, this is the mass of the Earth. So if you would like to consider the, the Earth as the calculator, the Earth, the whole Earth itself, so this is the mass that you have to take into consideration. And the speed of light and the reduced Planck constant, you just get the uh, right here, 10 to the 75 bits per second as the uh, something kind of a device which is able to calculate. Again, there's another limit, uh, comes by the Margulis and Levitin. Um, actually, that's a limit uh, proposed by the quantum processing here. Okay, so uh, there's a limit for one bit here, okay, again. Uh, so this is um, uh, this comes from the, actually, the uh, quantum uh, physics, actually. Okay, uh, quantum mechanics has a limit on the bit rate here, uh, be processed by a physical transition here, like it's been a, a flip 
extent. But maximum rate of elementary operations that are given by 2e over 5, which is a limit that would be attained by an ideal quantum computer. But you, you have, we have to realize one thing. These are all theoretical limits at the moment. So uh, a computer, how can we have a computer which works with the uh, maximum speed and bit rate? What would be the maximum bit rate or something like? If you're, if you're asking that kind of questions, these theoretical uh, actual limits give you the answer in terms of the uh, limits. So this is this was the number one, the bit rate or the processing speed, but unfortunately it's not the only one. We do have some other limits uh, for the computation. Here's another one, the processor thickness. It's also known as the ball of processor thickness, okay? Um, this is the um, Moore's law here, uh, the number of transistors integrated on a circuit chip right here, starting at the 1970 all the way to the uh, actually um, last year here. So when we started out in 1971 with Intel's uh, 4004 um, uh, uh, here, it was four bits, right? And the number of transistors was uh, just about 2000 something, okay, 2000 transistors or something. And it was, you know, the 12 here the millimeter square. And the, the thickness was 10,000 nanometers here. But today, you now uh, we have this AMD's Epic ROM 64 bit processor, and the number of transistors on it right here is almost 40 billion. 40, it's got 40 billion transistors. And as for the thickness, we've got the seven nanometers or 12 nanometers here. Okay. Uh, can we have, can we build some processors? Uh, even, um, even even like uh, four nanometers, three nanometers, even more, uh, uh, you know, than those. Yes, actually, uh, in a um, uh, in a theoretical wise, yes, we can do that. However, it's not the problem of engineering here. Okay, the problem here is even if we have the technology to have something like uh, three nanometers, two nanometers in terms of the processor thickness, what happens is after the four nanometers. The silicon goes quantum, okay? That means that the metric space uh, is no more, and now we have the quantum space, okay? And in the quantum space, uh, we know that it's, uh, the um, reliability of computing is not really that good. So that means, so that, means that the, if you're in the quantum realm, uh, the Heisenberg's principle uh, is in effect. So that means that um, when you add the 2 plus 2 10 times, you may not get the same answer all the time. So that's called the uh, quantum blues, actually, quantum problems, which is one of the biggest problems of the quantum world at the moment. So the, the processor thickness is another uh, limiting factor in terms of the uh, um, programming, coding, or computation, whatever you call it. So the third one is the heat dissipation. That's another problem. Actually, von Neumann defined that a computer which operates under temperature T will at least uh, Kb times T times uh, L2 joules heat dissipation for every single bit irreversible operation in 1949. So what that means is, if you do the irreversible operations on bits, okay, each time you do it, okay, you have this much of the energy uh, we'll have as the heat generated by the computer. Well, it's quite an understandable thing. If you put your laptop on your actual lap, you can understand, you can easily feel how hot it gets. So that's the reason, that's the reason uh, we get it. Uh, although we have lots of lots of cooling systems and stuff like that, it still comes uh, heated up. That is because all the operations actually in a, a typical um, um, silicon based computer, typical Turing machines, they're all irreversible operations because we use the end gates. So end gates, uh, are the irreversible uh, operators, and if the if the operation is irreversible, it just you just get extra heat as the heat dissipation. That, so that's another problem. Okay, and the Landauer said only logically irreversible operations will have heat dissipation in 1961. And again, uh, since your computer, so you, since your processor is just made out of the end gates actually, end gate and a not gate. When you combine those end and not, you can get any kind of a gates, but actually. Uh, you start out with the end gates always, and end gates is an uh, irreversible processor. So deletion is also uh, irreversible. That means that uh, when you delete something, you have a tiny a thermodynamic cost. Okay. And here, um, here's an example. You have a one centimeter cube volume computer. Uh, it has 10 to the 18 logic gates and operations under the room temperature with the one gigahertz speed. So if you have this kind of a computer, that kind of a computer with the specs, with the specs it just causes three megawatt per second heat dissipation for every single logically irreversible end operation, okay? 
So uh, that's that explains why we have all bunch of different cooling systems for our uh, gate uh, uh, servers. You know, if you have lots of lots of servers putting in a building, so that means that you have a lots of again you will have to lots of uh, cooling systems to cool all those servers because of this um, irreversibility. So that's another problem, the energy. Uh, so that's for the uh, limits of the computation. Here's one example. Uh, you can see actually. Uh, Intel's core is seven here. It goes all the way up to the uh, 70 degrees Celsius, and, you know, 70 and even more. Okay, this is without the cooling. So if, if you don't cool your processor, this is what you end up with. Okay. Um, again, this um, some Planck units. Let's remember the Planck units which I'm going to be using here. Uh, the, these are actually the Planck length is a very small length. So uh, 1.6 times the 10 to the, uh, the minus 35 meters here. And you can derive the uh, Planck mass, time, charge, and Planck temperature right here. I'll be using the um, Planck length uh, very much. So that's why I put it here so that, you know, it just serves us to remember one more time. So the Planck length uh, named after Planck himself, okay, is a very small, very small uh, thing, uh, 1.6, again, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters. Okay, we'll be using that. All right. <clears throat> Here's another uh, limit or bounds on information storage and erasure. That's black holes. That's another thing which we'll be talking about here. What's a black hole here? Okay, it, it, it's just a massive astrophysical object that is theorized to be created from the collapse of the neutron stars or if you're in the fabric of a space time or a gravitational soliton. These are uh, by the Bekenstein actually uh, about two decades ago. And we know that the, uh, the um, gravitation is so much so uh, higher in the black holes. So even the light cannot escape. So that in turn means that whatever goes in the black hole cannot return actually, okay? So that's why we call them as the black holes. Okay, right. Here we go again. Um, this time we'll be talking about, let me go one minute. Previous. Okay. What kind of um, bounds uh, that the black holes can impose us actually in terms of the information storage? Here's the idea. Okay. This is the, the well, actually, this is one of the magnificent ideas, um, actually. Okay. Here's our uh, black hole event horizon right here. And the idea is, okay, let's digitize the, this whole black hole by the triangulation, uh, such in, uh, uh, in that way. So each triangulation uh, has got either the ones or zero in here. And uh, the one fourth of the, uh, each square, each, each triangle here is a one Planck area here, a Planck length times Planck type, of course, here, okay? And four smaller um, triangles constitute one big triangle here which constitutes only one or zero in there. And that this thing called as the Bekenstein number here. And also it's the one unit of entropy or one unit of the information, okay? So the, the, the entropy or the information content of the black hole is given by this formula here. Uh, that's the Boltzmann constant here, uh, the speed of the light and the uh, gravitational constant. And this, this is the drag constant. Actually now this, uh, the black hole entropy uh, formula uh, defines the uh, limit as to how much information can you store in the whole universe. If this is uh, one of the uh, black holes, so we know that by uh, examining the uh, surface area of the uh, of its um, the, um, the event horizon, uh, we can actually know how much information that we can store on that uh, black hole, or how much information that this black hole is able to uh, capable of erasing. Okay, that's another um, uh, limit. So here's an example. Okay, consider th th this uh, black hole with one centimeter in diameter. Okay, it has the capability of 10 to the 66 bits here. And this is roughly equals to the, uh, the water entropy, water entropy uh, or the formation contained in this uh, whole cube, cube, which is um, on each side, it's 10 to the 10, uh, 10 over uh, six kilometers. So, okay. And if you um, um, let this consider as the information maximum, uh, for the one centimeter cube memory. So this is the how much information you can put in there. So that means that if you have a small memory, small hard disk, whatever you call it, with one centimeter uh, cube memory, okay, uh, whatever the, uh, whatever you just, uh, you can make it out, 
probably uses silicon or anything. So the maximum information that you can store in that, in terms of the thermodynamics here, this is the information, maximum information that you can put in there. And this is also another uh, information, uh, another graph here. That's the human chromosome in terms of the uh, data gathering here, how much uh, information that you can put in the human chromosome or the Library of Congress or internet. And so this is the, your uh, limits in terms of the data storage here. Um, okay, so the, this information storage and erosion limit is also known as the Bekenstein bound here, right here. Okay, this is the Boltzmann uh, actually constant and the energy and the spherical size of the uh, spherical system size and the entropy and the other. So uh, this is the, uh, the limit of the information storage in terms of the uh, limitations. Okay, now since uh, currently now we know the limits of the computation, now we can start the asking the, some kind of deep questions here. Okay, the uh, one question is, can universe compute? Or is universe a gigantic computer? Or is there a deeper physical description of the world uh, or of the universe based on information? Can you define the universe totally based on information? Is there any, any deeper physical descriptions? Or does the fabric of the universe on a Planck scale, nothing but a form-like structure of information? Okay, you go deeper and deeper and deeper. So you end up with the uh, probably kind of an information structure which is, looks like a form, nothing but a form, okay? Or like an area of servers creating a virtual cloud. Is this the only universe or do we have parallel universes? A multiverse, nothing but an area of universes. So these are actually the deep questions and let's try to understand, let's try to find out if we're gonna be able to answer at least some of them. Okay, here we go. So let's uh, remember the information capacity of the universe. So the information capacity of the black hole was given by the Bekenstein and Hawking right here. And actually uh, the upper bound for the total number of bits of information that have been processed by all the matter in the universe is also 10 to the 120 here. Okay, these are for the remember. Now, the question is, okay, let's assume that the whole universe that we know of today becomes a black hole, okay? Since we know the, right here, go back. Since we know the, uh, the information capacity of a black hole here, Okay, we can understand, we can calculate, we can actually compute how much information that a black hole can uh, deposit or erase since we know this formula. Now we can ask this question. What if the whole universe becomes a black hole? Okay, so that means that you have the universal information and that is measured by entropy in bits and right here. And let's call it as the information universe here. Okay, this, this whole universe turns into the black hole. And in that case, this is the much of the information that you can store in this whole universe right here, okay? So this information universe actually presents a cosmological limit to the length of the tip of a Turing machine. Remember uh, our um, abstract model of, of the Turing machine was just a tape unbounded by both sides? No, there is a limit for the Turing machine, okay? That means that your Turing machine does not go endlessly because of, even if the whole universe turns into to the information, this is the much of the information that you can store on that Turing tape. So that means that your Turing tape or your calculating environment, whatever you call it, is actually uh, limited on practically every side. So this is also the limit of uh, information processing. And this formula also means that any effective computation, that means that that computation should be end by some um, time and the, it should produce a result either yes or no, that's what we call as the effective computation. That effective computation should be done by a computer must end with that Planck time, okay? So these are the limitations. So if, if you turn out the whole universe, okay. Now let's go back. Um, and by the way, um, there's an, another um, um, solution right here about a decade ago by Egan and Line Weaver here. Okay, for the information universe, that was the, uh, the answer that they come up with, okay? They were able to point out um, um, calculating as for the information universe about uh, 3.1 times 10 to the uh, 104 bits in terms of this information universe. This is the uh, information, the whole universe as we know of at the moment, okay? Uh, that's the topic of the, uh, actually the, um, our today's talk, uh, the famous physician, John, uh, John Wheeler. John Wheeler, um, he was also famous by, uh, you know, known as the calling of the terms like the, uh, the uh, black holes have no hairs or something. But this term, uh, this, this concept actually, it from it, 
um, comes by the wheeler. And by it from bit, what he means is, he says, every, uh, everything, every particle, every field of force, even the space-time continuum itself, derives its function, meaning its very existence entirely from answers to yes or no questions. So that means that when you go into the Planck uh, space, all the Planck scale, uh, the, the form that you end up probably, that's uh, theoretically we think of, uh, is nothing but the uh, ones or zeros or the questions that can be answered by the ones or zeros. So uh, here the it means ones or zero um, or, uh, from bit here, everything, it, whatever it is, all everything uh, comes by the bit. So bit is ones or, or either one or zero. So everything that you hear it is uh, originates uh, by the uh, ones or zeros. And as for proofs, uh, he's got actually a couple of proofs. Actually, uh, there are four different proofs, but uh, two of them is uh, easy to understand here. One is the yes or no that is recorded constantly is an unsplitable bit of information. A photon cannot be cloned, okay? So if you have a photon, you cannot clone it. It's either one or zero. That's the very basic uh, ingredient of the, the whole fabric of the universe. And also the surface area of the horizon of a black hole rotating or not, that is, measures the entropy of the black hole. Again, when you digitize it into the ones or zeros, as for the back numbers, you can actually define the limits of the whole universe in here. So the it from bit concept by Wheeler means in total in, uh, in a summation, uh, everything, whatever that is in this whole universe actually uh, constitutes by the ones or zeros uh, on a different levels. So everything here uh, by the ones or zeros. And so as for the conclusions, what I uh, would suggest after all of these, first of all, the information on Planck level, it's physical entity and it's directly measurable. Um, since we have the regular calculus and uh, casual dynamic triangulation CDT, um, you can approach the information from the discrete or the continuous perspective, depending on the scale of which the observations and measurements have been made. Um, this scale dependent duality actually, uh, total compliance with the observations and measurements of the nature and the fabric of information, which have been perplexing the mankind throughout the history of science. And so that means that on the Planck level, uh, like the right here, what the uh, Wheeler suggests, on the Planck level, information itself can be considered as the space-time itself or vice versa. Another way of saying, I mean, it reach the Planck level, the, the whole fabric uh, of the universe of whatever it is actually, is nothing but the information. And since it's discrete, that means that it can be effectively computed as a discrete and dimensional digital manifold. That, that's a mathematical term actually, the manifolds. And if you consider everything ones or zero, that means it's a digital. So the, it's a discrete, it's n-dimensional manifold. That's uh, what I gather as the whole fabric of the universe here. And if you go this way, okay, and the uh, now this term, instead of the whole universe or the universe, information universe, this time I'm after the information plank here, uh, not information universe, but information plank. So this is the Boltzmann concept of Boltzmann here, Boltzmann concept. And the, the ICDM is the, the information capacity of a digital manifold, and it's the Boltzmann constant here. So you can actually uh, define it. And on the, uh, so the, for your entropy, again, this time uh, you can actually, when you put the right here, uh, the Boltzmann uh, constant and the, the, the information capacity of the digital manifold, you can actually here uh, get the, uh, either the entropy or the uh, factor information. Oh, in short, um, let's go back a little bit to all the questions, your questions here, um, right here. Can universe compute or is universe a gigantic computer? Well, first of all, um, the, the answer to those questions, yes, it might be a gigantic computer. However, that computation, I do not think is the, the way that we know of the, as the computation of. Yes, it may be a gigantic computer, it may compute. However, again, this computation uh, is entirely different than what we know of. Not like a Turing machine, not like a silicon based or a, a molecular computing. This, this computation uh, must, must be or could be uh, entirely different than our uh, way of thinking of the computation. But again, um, if we try to understand the universe, 
uh, on a, based on the information levels, then it will be easier for us to simulate, uh, for us to uh, simply, it's going to be easier for us to, um, com uh, to compute it because the discrete information is what we know of in a better way. Um, again, my uh, idea about, well, the uh, philosophical answer to those questions, actually, whether it's a big gigantic computer or whether it can compute or not, um, actually, yes, again, not the way we understand uh, how it does, though. But on, on, um, other than that, uh, this is another question here, uh, like an area of service creating a virtual cloud, do we have the parallel universes, multiverses, nothing but an area of universes? That's another issue altogether. And right here, there's another problem, which is, um, I haven't put it here, here yet. Are we living in a big simulation environment? Uh, if yes, uh, if, if the answer would be yes, then the uh, next question will be, then who else uh, governing that simulation? Uh, whom or who? So that's altogether different issues, but, but um, before answering whether this, this everything that we know of is a, a big gigantic simulation or not, um, the, 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 the whole universe is actually a computing environment, but as I said, uh, altogether different way of computation. Now let's go back to the very last one. So probably if I uh, end up my time here, uh, I would like to try to answer if, uh, your questions if you've got any. So let me return the control to our um, host here to Dr. Eugen, and I'll try to answer your questions if I may. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Koltuksus. Now uh, we would like to take questions and uh, you can text them in the chat or you can directly unmute your microphone and ask them however you like. But um, can I start with one question by taking the advantage of being the host? Uh, uh, thank you very much again. And I'd like to ask about Bremerman limits. Now, uh, it's not like a limit like uh, Moore's law, but it's uh, no. it also have uh, bits per second like a communication or, uh, and it is comparable to the speed of light. Can you elaborate it on Bremerman limits a little bit more? Okay, let me open it up here. Okay, that's what it is, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and here, actually, um, let me put it a whole screen here. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, this is um, as its original uh, original proposed. It didn't have no any relativity um, compatibility, but here um, it's much like a, a bitrate uh, in terms of the speed of the light and uh, co combined or coupled with the, the mass of the computing device in here, okay? And um, <clears throat> um, actually, a, it's, it's one of the limits in terms of the bitrate, the, the, the processing speed. But then again, like um, when you see the bits per second, it's like the communication medium, how much information that I can transfer from one side onto the another one. And in that case, we have the Shannon's information measurements and everything. But in here, uh, you have to understand not this is not the uh, propagation rate. This is the rate of which uh, your processor does the processing in terms of the bits per second. You're not transferring any bits in here, but this time consider all you have, you have you've got a whole bunch of end gates and everything, and you're processing your bits through the end gates in a uh, given amount of time. So this is what the Bremerman's limit, this is what he proposes, but actually um, you have to get into the um, um, uh, general relativity correction in here. And um, it's not much different, 10 to the 47, 10 to the 40, uh, 43 here, but nevertheless, this one is a uh, much corrected value. But again, uh, consider this as there is this one machine, whatever that is, consider the laptop or a, um, a mainframe or any kind of a computing device in here, any kind of thing which is able to uh, process. And that process in terms of bits is measured right here by this formula, okay? This is not a propagation rate, it's the processing rate of the bits through the gates. But then again, if you um, consider like the, uh, the uh, molecular computing, then uh, the bit rate is nonsense in here. 
So the bitrate actually is one of the digital way of uh, executing digital way of processing. So if you have that kind of a processing, then this limit can be applicable. But if you change your processing strategy, uh, this, this limit may not uh, have any sense at all. Hope that, is, that, that satisfies your question though. Yeah, thank you very much. So it's, it's like um, this correction there is like Lorentzian corrections in gravity. Yes, it is actually, it is actually. Okay. Because, okay. yeah, because well, uh, now this, this limit is actually, um, um, does not have any uh, Lorentzian factors here, okay? Uh, it's like the uh, uh, typical uh, Newtonian approach. But then again, you have to have some Lorentzians, some gamma factors and everything. That way, you just end up with this one. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, sure. Any questions, any um, ideas or discussions, anything, you guys? If not, I have another one. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I have to let uh, others uh, ask first. Okay. Okay. Still waiting. Okay. Um, let me um, rephrase one thing. Uh, that's about the uh, Moore's law here. Actually, the Moore's law dead. It has been dead for more than a decade here. Okay. Um, but we still try to understand or try to measure the number of transistors, this time not per the, uh, the, uh, um, the cost of it, but this time number of transistors against the thickness here, okay? So uh, for that, the uh, Moore's law is a bit now different. Uh, probably a version, a new version of the uh, Moore's law should be in action. Um, so the thickness is uh, what it counts at the moment here. Okay, so it's important to consider this. Okay, so for that reason, uh, you know, uh, we certainly hope that you know uh, we should be getting some some uh, processors, you know, even uh, some somewhat like four, three or four or probably two nanometers uh, in terms of a thickness, but not anymore, unfortunately, we can't. So that's why we're uh, talking about the quantum computing or the parallel computing or the molecules and stuff like that, because uh, there's a very um, limiting wall in terms of the processor thicknesses. Okay, any more questions, anything? Come on, guys, shoot it. Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> all right, probably there are too many uh, equations here and um, probably it's hard to uh, memorize all of those uh, the equations and everything. So um, probably if you, uh, so far as I understand, this will be broadcasted in YouTube as well. If you um, see it uh, later on, if you watch it one more time, you'll probably uh, you know, appreciate the, all the formulas and everything. And then you probably uh, end up with the questions. And, and even, if, even if you don't have one, if you think about it, and you'll, I'm sure that, I'm pretty sure that you're gonna get some more and more uh, deeper questions than I've proposed actually. And, um, because asking the questions is a lot important than answering them. So look on that. Okay. So. Okay, then um, thank you very much for this precious information that you give us, Professor Koltupsus. And thank, thank you. you all for joining us. So uh, if there are no more questions, I would like to conclude this seminar, if you allow me to. Okay, thanks everyone. All right, thank you again, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.